Hello and welcome to a Learn Conversation. My name is Sylvia Serres and my guests today are Sulvai Nigor, uh, a global fish health manager in Greek seafood ASA, and Cecilia Valde, who is a PhD candidate at the Norwegian Veterinary Institute. Welcome, Cecilia, and welcome, Sulvai. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm just going to uh, say a few words about our conversation before uh, we get started uh, with the with the discussions, just so I can place this into a series. And uh, so this is a part of uh, five or six conversations that Learn is having with NCE Seafood Innovation, which is a national center of expertise about fish farming, uh, in uh, based in Norway. And uh, we are focusing on uh, their AquaCloud data platform and its uh, development, but also its usage and effects on uh, production of seafood, but also uh, related industries. And in this conversation, we are go going to focus uh, especially in depth on um, the, the, the biological aspects of uh, uh, applications of aqua cloud and um, uh, perhaps also more on what is fish welfare and how how do we optimize it in addition to optimizing production does that sound okay yeah yes excellent okay. so so then we'll get started with a, with a, with a, my my standard first question which is the most difficult of them all and it is who are you and what has made you so and uh, we will start with Survai. Thank you. You can see I'm a very old woman and I have been in, involved in fish farming since 1985. And um, most of it in the production out at sea. So my, uh, and just the last year I've been uh, in Greek seafood working with global strategies. But my from my point of view, it's a production and fish health and fish welfare in production. So I am a veterinarian and a specialist in fish diseases. So you are by training veterinarian, which is, uh, again, for those of us not very well uh, uh, um, versed in all the definitions, if I say it's a doctor for animals and you specialize in fish, am I saying something very wrong? No, that's right. It's a, it's a fish doctor. Mm. Fish doctor, and you you care about uh, the physical health of fish, but also their welfare, which is more perhaps their uh, mental welfare. Yes, that's a behavior, and and how they how they accept their own conditions out in the in the tanks in the in the cage. That's right. Do they seem like happy fish? <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, in my next life, I'm I'm going to be a. a a fish uh, psychologist. <laughs> Very cool. Perhaps you're you're that already, with with what we're going to talk about now. So so um, I think it's a fascinating uh, fascinating um, topic, partially because you know, I think we underestimate the psychology of the beings we can't understand, and uh, I think that's partly also why we behave less well towards seafood. Sorry, sea life. Then, then we behave towards uh, life uh, that's uh, you know the, the traditional household animals, and I'd love to ask you more about that. Uh, but but before we do that, uh, Cecilia, who are you? Well, I I just want to say uh, first that I think Solvay would be the best fish psychologist uh, of them all. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm a, I'm a fish health biologist, so uh, uh, that's a five-year study containing mainly just studies on fish. So, um, uh, and I also have um, economy from uh, different universities in addition to that. And I worked with uh, diagnosing fish diseases for many years. And I actually also worked in the field with Solvay or for Solvay. Um, and now I'm doing a PhD, which is um, an interdisciplinary um, 
PhD between um, uh, fish health and um, economy. Say, say two more sentences about that. So happy fish means more money and uh, more sustainable production or some such? Yeah, that's that's what we're trying to find out. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a complex it's complex. So uh, how happy does the fish need to be to make money? Uh, that's some of the issues. Very uh, rough, uh, mm. roughly. Mm. Mm. No, I, I, I uh, I'm just going to throw one more question back at you, and then I have one more question for uh, Sulvay. And Celia, in the first conversation in the series, I, I, I heard two numbers, and they stuck in my mind. And one of them says that we are currently producing 1.1 million tons of salmon per year in fish farms, and the other number said that we want to raise that uh, number to five million tons of salmon per year. And I forget the, the the time perspective here, but it was something like 2050 or 2035. Hmm. And in my mind, if we are going to multiply the current production by five, given our natural resources, we really have to solve the problem that the two of you are talking about. Because unless we know that the fish are uh, handled in a, in a uh, long perspective, happy way, we, we we can't grow more fish. No, and I think actually the basis for the numbers you that stuck in your head, uh, those are based on those problems being solved. So, mm. so, so I, I, I just had to add something about fish welfare and, and when you're talking about money and fish welfare, because when we are taking a living organism, a living animal like a fish that can percept and could have good nerves, uh, we are responsible to treat this animal uh, as good as possible. So that's welfare. It's not only money, but we are very happy that usually good fish health correspond or are linked to good fish welfare. But we have we are responsible when we produce food from a living organism. Yes, I I totally agree, and I think it's it's very important to remember that money is only something that we we set we humans. So we we need to think about uh, th this is from our perspective, not the fish perspective. Uh, we decide what's the value of the fish. It's not only the market price that decide it. It's what's the value of a fish is a very difficult question. And that sort of sets the premises for doing these economic analysis. So we need to have very thorough ethic and moral discussions around what is the price and what reflects the price so it's uh, that's why i say it's a complex issue because mm. yeah what's all so, so, says so so you know uh, norwegian salmon conducts a good price uh, commands a good price because uh, uh, you know they people think it's clean waters it's uh, you know associated with a country that that uh, is uh, very responsible in the way that it fish farms uh, and i'd like to uh, kind of delve into that uh, also even as a branding question more but but uh, i i want to go back uh, to to something that sulvay said first of all sulvay you said you're an old lady and um, I, I i won't ask you about what you mean by that. I, I turned 50, by the way, this last summer, and I decided that 50 is no age because I think age is defined by how much you have ahead of you, not how much you have behind you of, you know, life and action and plans and dreams. And uh, I, I still think I'm going to work for 30 years to come. And I really don't want anyone to tell me it's, uh, you know, time to stop developing because uh, that's absolutely unacceptable. So, um, but I, I still want to go back to, a year that you said, and it's 85, you said you've been working in fish farming since 85. That's 35 years ago. And uh, how old is fish farming in Norway? And, you know, could you tell us a little bit about the, the history of this field? Because from my understanding, we were a first mover when it comes to salmon. Yeah, that's right. Um, oh, 
I can't use so much time, but I've been I've been happy to follow to to work to, to walk together with the fish farmers from very small uh, family owned uh, producers, and they had to made up all their they had to find uh, uh, every equipment themselves because you couldn't buy it anywhere. Uh, and 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 sometimes they were about to go bankrupt, and some of them went bankrupt. So I've been following this industry for all this year, and that's been very exciting. And uh, especially now, because we are we are we are going into an industrial uh, industrial stage, and um, and uh, still it's very high focus in fish health and fish welfare. And I'm happy about about that because that is what I'm concerned about, and I'm working with. And we get new problems all the time. Uh, and then the industry, uh, it has solved them. Like we had very hard uh, mortalities from bacterial diseases, and it was the whole industry was about to collapse. About uh, yeah, from eighty eight to eighty nine, about. Uh, but then we got uh, vaccines, working vaccines, and uh, and the fish survive, and we have a very low antibiotic uh, usage in Norway compared to other uh, salmon producers. Mm. Um, I, so, so some uh, 40 years ago or 35 years ago, some people had this idea that they are going to put some, some salmon in a pen out in the open sea. And mm. uh, it sounded a bit like a crazy idea because salmon are these uh, long distance journey fish. Uh, and, and, and still it worked. Why, why, you know, I, I, I'm just fascinated by, you know, how does an industry start uh, i think uh, i think the first it, it's it's so many people around in the world with good ideas and when they have uh, the courage to start to try very many of them fail and <laughs> if if they if we don't have these people we will not go further in our production so many of these people have been uh, one of them from uh, from my uh, county he was selling clothes for for females, and he was going to Denmark uh, to to buy what we is, he's going to sell in Norway. And he saw that they had rainbow trout in uh, in ponds. And then he thought, oh, we have to try that in Norway. Then they started with the rainbow trout in ponds, uh, south to Stavanger, and then they continued with the salmon. So that was one of this the first fish farmer. So it's fascinating how it started, but it's also fascinating the development and it's been very many bumps in the in the road okay, just one more question there so when you say ponds is that on shore and then because there was this movement offshore which i think also is very very uh, courageous yeah they started with ponds uh, on shore and then it was tanks and then they started with the, the pens in out in the sea mm. And now we have pens, and please correct my numbers now, because this is the stuff I both want to learn and I want my listeners to, to remember. If I understood correctly, uh, Cecilia, uh, one of these uh, standard pens is, uh, uh, I forget how big, but somebody gave me a picture. I know it's 200,000 fish in one. But I forget how deep and how wide, but I know that uh, you can dip uh, Boeing uh, 7 to 7, I think, in one of these. Uh, I think that there's different measures. I'm not sure how the big is. Do you know? I think Solvay is better at this than, than me uh, yeah. in this size. The largest one around, around the circle is 200 meters, but the most usual is 160 meters. That's a circle. And then the diameter is about 50, uh, yeah, 50 mm. meters or something like that. And how deep? It depends on the, uh, it depends on the shore. So uh, some places only 10 meters, but usually 20 meters. And uh, up can to I 40. ask you a stupid question? Do they have a bottom? Yes, of course. Yeah, mm. they Otherwise have a the fish would... Uh... Yeah, yeah, they have a bottom. And in the bottom, they have a system to take up any dead fish. And usually you have many cameras in every in every pen or cage, so you could uh, have a surveillance system for the fish. Where is, is it on the surface? It, uh, how is it eating? And uh, do we have many <laughs> uh, 
not uh, not performing fish and things like that. So it's it's a technological. Uh, yeah, today it's Wonder. it's more more interesting. Hmm. And 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 one more question about the pen itself. So it has. Um, I understand it's made usually from nylon. And uh, it has uh, holes in it so that the water can go through, uh, but the fish can't. Correct? That's right. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. So if, when you transfer a small fish, maybe 100 grams to the sea, you have a you have small holes in the net. But when it's growing and maybe the average size is four kilo, you have a larger hole, so it could come more. Uh, uh, the current could could flow through on a better way. Mm. And it's easy. And, and it, hmm. so, so, sorry, and the fish that are in this cage, um, they uh, the two hundred thousand fish to a huge volume of water, so they can move around both vertically and horizontally. And um, they uh, do. Do you do they 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 they, they live their whole life in this pen uh, from the placement and it's about one year or eight months to, to, to 16 months depending on where they are geographically based or how should we think about the life of one of these pen fishes? Uh, they start uh, their life on like the, the wild salmon in freshwater and are hatched and maybe they, they the, it, it depends on the temperature uh, they use f- about one year from hatching to sea transfer um, at, at land, but sometimes if you want to have a larger uh, fish at sea transfer, maybe it's uh, up to yeah, maybe up to two years. That's a very long production time in in freshwater, and then they transfer to the pens. And in the northern part of Norway, it's maybe at Iceland and an and area with very cold seawater in in periods, Russia, for example, you may have a production time up to two years in the sea pen. But usually on our I'm living on the west coast of Norway, so hell, it, we want it to be up to 10, 10 months, but then we need to have a, a large, small, what you call it, to, that, that's transferred from freshwater to seawater. So usually 15 to 16 months in seawater, that's the life, that's the average life today. And, and her, here comes a real dummy question, and then I promise I'll stop. So... Um... Do they make babies when they're in these pens or do they have to be able to go to freshwater in order to, to, to mate or h- how does that work? I think Cecilia can ask. <laughs> no, they, do, they don't. We don't want um, fish to to um, to mate in, in the pens. Um, the, the flesh gets a bit um, uh, waterish. And it's it's a bad quality to eat a fish that's about to to get uh, to, or that's ready to mate. So so we don't want that. Uh, and I also uh, think it's important what Solvay says that it's it's very this is a complex production because like uh, the the fish is very sensitive to its environment. It uh, it's not like a warm-blooded animal. It's a cold-blooded animal. So the the temperature um, affects how they grow. In cold water, they grow slower. In warm water, they grow faster. So so it's um, aquaculture is a complex. Uh, it's it's complex farming. But could I just add something? When we have problems in the in production, we always have to go back to nature. What is happening to, to salmon in nature? And, and in nature, the fish at now at the moment in our rivers, the first fish is coming back from the Atlantic and coming up in the rivers just to prepare, prepare their, their uh, uh, spawning. Um, and, and that's what's happening also in the industry. We have to take the fish up in fresh water and when they are go, when they are, are ready for spawning and they are spawning in fresh water and the eggs are fertilized in fresh water they, they will not <laughs> survive if they are fertilized in seawater so we have to always to look at nature what is the best for the fish in nature but been uh, developed through thousands of years in nature and we we have to to uh, to do our production like nature very cool so, so it's a complex production. I would like to ask you a little bit more about uh, this 
point that that uh, Cecilia opened up on. So fish are a cold-blooded animal. They are very different animal from uh, from. You know, I, I understand if I have some chicken or if I have some some pigs or if I have a cow, I I, I, can, I can relate a little bit more easily to are they are they are they happy? Are they is it you know decent welfare or not? But I don't even know where to begin thinking about fish welfare. So maybe maybe we start with Sulvai again. Sulvai, what what is fish welfare? Fish welfare is you when you take an animal an animal in your in your you 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 decide for this animal and then you have to uh, this animal you have to give it conditions that it could uh, it could grow and and uh, not be uh, not be uh, not have any diseases and 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 also what we think is happy that could be difficult to decide in fish but we have got more and more measurements and we have learned quite the more and more about the behavior. So we today, and we use very much camera, uh, camera surveillance today, so uh, it's easier to decide. But uh, we have to give the, the conditions we have to, to give the, our culture salmon should be uh, the best to survive and to not only to survive, but to thrive. Mm. What, what what do you think, uh, Cecilia? Yeah, I totally agree. They have to. It's like the, the behavior they have in nature, and that's natural to them. They should be allowed to to have the freedom to behave what's natural to them, and and they should also uh, have the opportunity to to have a, a good environment and be free of diseases and yeah, have enough space and yeah, be a, a happy animal. And fish welfare sort of pushes our limits of perspective because they are so different from us. It's difficult to understand a human, or not a human being, but an animal being that's so different from us and lives in a completely different environment than us. So it's, it pushes us to, to broaden our perspective and, uh, and we should be pushed. And it's our responsibility also to, to push that perspective. I have to ask you a personal uh, side question. Uh, there is a documentary on Netflix called What I've Learned from My Octopus Teacher. Have you seen that? No, actually, I haven't. But my mother saw it yesterday and she said, you have to see it. Uh, it is wonderful. And it's this guy somewhere uh, off the coast of Australia um, that uh, has a, you know, a life crisis and uh, burnout and uh, goes back to his childhood uh, cottage and uh, goes down every day to, uh, yeah, pool, um, uh, tidal pool and dives with a uh, free dives with an octopus. And uh, learning about how they live and how they, uh, the octopus accepts him eventually and moves freely around him and uh, kind of brings him into its own world. And it's a part of this, you know, what makes a happy octopus. Uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, I, I, yeah. so, 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 you know, going back to what makes a happy salmon, especially if it's penned in, uh, it is, as both both of you were saying, it's our human responsibility uh, if we are going to be uh, industrializing a production uh, based around uh, a living being, we have to make sure that they have decent conditions. That's the only way to do this sustainably. That's right. So, and just, just a comment, uh, for, because of people working out on the by the tanks and they're working every day with the fish, they are the best uh, psychologists. Uh, so some years ago, an anthropologist from Oslo, she went out and she worked in different farms and she made a book, Becoming Salmon. And she describes in details uh, how the different persons could uh, observe the fish and oh something is wrong I could see it on the behavior so they are very clever but what is difficult is to standardize this these registrations on on behavior but uh, people working with fish they are very they are trained and they have a trained eye and they are very interested in the fish 
So if we now connect this and maybe go towards Cecilia's PhD as well. So we are gathering data in production and it has to do with fish size and fish numbers and, and environmental data, etc. And then uh, Sulva, if you could perhaps start us off, if I'm understanding this at a very basic level, the idea is that what we're trying to do is look for patterns in this data that somehow align with this intuition that people who have worked with the fish all their life have. Yeah, that's right. We are, we are, uh, today we are, we have uh, registering uh, many data from water quality, uh, appetite, mortality, behavior, but what, and also diseases. But what the problem is that uh, we have many different, uh, the different farmers and the different vets maybe are doing it in a different way. So we, we need to have more standardized uh, way to do it so we can compare and, and, uh, and take out and have a more, um, uh, uh, the, so the bet the the goals are are more are becoming better. Hmm. Better and, quantified and, uh, goals um, or or better measurable goals. Measurable. What you are doing, your your efforts should be more uh, effective. When you know why is it why is the appetite going down now? Uh, why is this behavior? Maybe all the fish are going in the surface. And you could uh, put together many uh, registrations, maybe from the water quality, maybe from algae, and and then we could know. And it's better to next time to be more prepared, maybe with oxygen, maybe with pressure here in the in the water to take up deep water. Uh, so that what we have to 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 standardize to 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 be better to be better prepared. Uh, as, as, yeah. uh, Cecilia, we're going to you in a second. I just want to hang on to a couple of images I have in my head now from what Sulvay was saying. Uh, one of the things that Björn um, um, was talking about is that the climate changes seem to be actually have this very paradoxical effect on the west coast of Norway that we have less severe storms, which is a problem in a couple of fjords because there isn't this uh, ability to move the water over the threshold and fresh water, etc. So what you said now, Sulvay, could be a solution because basically we could, in a way, pump fresh water with pressure for example, through the pen without damaging the fish, but still cleaning the water? Or, you know, am, am, am I having the right pictures in my head? We, yeah, we do it already. We, we, we try to do it, but sometimes we are not sure uh, to do it in the right time. Uh, if we had a bet, better surveillance system and better registration, and also we are, we are working today. Many fish farmers are, or the industry are working together, but it could be improved. Uh, so they could exchange uh, information and also experience what is how is it what is working and what is not working so good. Cool, Cecilia. Mm. What do you think? Data smart for fish welfare. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of opportunities in in uh, making use of all the data that's out there and also collecting it and standardizing it and that was one of my challenge or is one of my challenges in working with a data set that's quite huge it's a high resolution it's uh, daily recordings on performance from 2014 and to 2019 from three different companies and it's it takes a lot of time to put these three data sets together when they don't have the same language uh, and perhaps also not the same calculations of whatever they are calculating. So, so uh, I think there's a, a huge, a huge, um, uh, what do I say? A, a huge benefit from standardization. But I also think that uh, I'm a bit humble to these big data because. <laughs> I think my prior knowledge from working in the field, and it's also what Solvay says about the guys working closest to the fish. It's um, when you read such data, and it's a huge amount of data. You know, you you have to know what you are reading. 
you also have to know something about the pitfalls that might be there uh, or else it's possible to make the wrong conclusions because you didn't mm -hmm. know what what was the data actually saying how was it recorded who recorded it was it a storm was it when they count the fish is is it the bucket the, the lies in the bucket they counted uh, you you need to talk to the people that's out there doing the job and i i mean the workers at the farm the fish health service that they, they are the guys closest to the fish and they have a huge amount of knowledge about how to interpret such data so it's not just taking the big data and start starting to work with it you have to know what what you you're supposed to do with it uh, and also what the possible um, problems are I, I want to uh, just uh, refer to another conversation I had last week. I talked to a guy called Jura Islien, who is um, a statistician uh, working in health um, data, uh, among other things. And uh, we were just um, discussing how it's usually the mathematicians who see the limits of statistics and uh, big data and AI applied to different, especially life sciences. And I think what you're making, the point you're making now, uh, Cecilia, is extremely important because uh, statistics can tell you whatever you want, but you need to know what's the right question and what's the right context for the data. Mm -hmm. And it can't be uh, completely um, done uh, out of context of the people who actually uh, work with the system daily. No, you can get significant results, statistical significant results. That's not significant at all. You have to, I think prior knowledge is extremely important. Is this possible? Is this biological possible explanation? If it's not, then perhaps we should try another angle. It's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's extremely important to know the context you're working in. Mm. And it takes time to develop good data models and it takes time to get enough data as well. If you were to define the most important uh, aspects of data, uh, Sulvay, to, to be able to be a good fish psychologist, what, what would you be asking for? Uh, I would be asking for, of course, appetite. And also we are recording environmental conditions, but we have to 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 what is most important we can't recognize uh, we can't survey everything and and then it's 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 the behavior from the fish we have to be better by uh, surveillance and today uh, the technology is coming with camera surveillance uh, so we can see uh, is, is most of the fish on the surface or the, is it on the bottom and why what is the activity of the fish and um, also the the appetite maybe you can see some non performers in in uh, just close to the nets and things like that so and and that's what the the people out on the on the sea they are looking at this they are registering but it's not standardized they are maybe writing down in their, their daily books today the fish is all the fish you could see the fins and the surface I don't know why. <laughs> uh, so we need systems to to uh, to, to to standardize the, re the registrations. So, so two questions from somebody who doesn't know much about fish health. Uh, the problem of lice is coming up in every conversation we have, and mm -hmm. if you could just help me ask that question, if I ask that question one more time. So, a, a lice infested fish is uh, not a good fish and i don't understand why what's the big problem is it is it a sick fish is it a fish that's going to die or is it just a frustrated fish because it's scratchy or the the, the skin uh, hurts or you know what why do we need to get rid of lice and and is yeah. that a big difference between wild and 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 farmed uh, sea lice is a parasite eating eating from the skin and also sucking blood from the skin. So if you have heavy infections with with uh, sea lice, uh, the fish will be, the, the skin will be hurt, you will be get uh, ulcers and at the last they will die. But you need very heavy infections uh, before the fish will die. So today for the farmed fish, we have very low levels before we have to treat them. 
and uh, the reason the call the reason for that is that it should not be a challenge pressure to the wild fish mm-hmm. that's the most it important it shouldn't uh, spill out over and, and yeah it could be a challenge but because we can't treat the wild fish mm-hmm. so we have a very low limit when the wild fish is migrating from the rivers and to this to, to the atlantic uh, and our fish will never die when it have lies under these levels or thresholds that is the official thresholds in Norway. But that is to keep down the challenge pressure. So actually, uh, the fish health in Norway do not have directly uh, problems with the sea lice today, but it's the treatment we have to do for the sea to keep down the challenge pressure. That's a problem and that we have to improve. And sea lice is uh, there all the time or in particular temperatures or particular currents or? Cecilia? Well, the warmer the water, the higher the pressure uh, and also the denser the farms, uh, they might have spillovers from one farm to another. Uh, and and I think it's very important what Solvay says about uh, the treatment itself or the all the handling related to the treatment that's the, the problem here, uh, not the lice itself, uh, but it's the lice that that causes all the treatments. So um, uh, and uh, that's a fish welfare uh, issue, all the handling and treatment. So again, uh, a basic question. Um, ultimately, it could be a human welfare question as well, because uh, I'm, I'm just thinking now to I don't know um, uh, poultry or or to um, other kinds of, of farmed animals. Uh, in some countries, they are treated with uh, extreme amounts of hormones and antibiotics in order to avoid these kinds of problems. But that, of course, has long-term negative effects on our health as well. So, what about fish? I mean, how, do, do you can, can you even treat them with antibiotics in in, in salt water? Yeah, we can, but uh, it doesn't work against parasites, but against uh, bacterial diseases. But And we did it. We have to do it in the late 80s when we had bacterial diseases. Uh, but that is a huge environmental problem. So today, uh, the the usage of um, or the consumption of antibiotics in, in salmon and rainbow production it's 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 about nothing. No, and I think uh, the the main ways of treating today against uh, salmon lice or sea lice is non-medicinal treatment forms. So it's using either um, heated water or uh, mechanically brushing the lice of the fish. So um, or fresh water treatment. Yeah, or fresh water treatment. So, uh, so I don't think uh, for us humans, this is not a problem with what the fish may contain within its its flesh. It's more, more the fish welfare that's the issue here. Mm. So, so then we have defined fish welfare more or less, um, and uh, and and I think we are closing in on time. So. Um, Digital transformation related to fish welfare, it has to do something with data and data analysis. And if I understand you correctly, uh, Sulvay, you you are in a way asking for simplified registrations um, and and maybe automating even the data gathering. And then uh, and and Cecilia is doing models and trying to figure out which are the relevant models. Am I am I correct, or can you correct me? No, that's right. Uh, we we need to have a standardized and a good quality of what we put in our registrations. Mm. Now I'll also try to to take the biological perspective and connect it to the economic perspective, and perhaps also raise questions which we have done uh, in in this session as to how do we do it. Um, and and what is uh, and I think our society needs this ethical and moral awareness of how do we think about economics because it's only a 
blanket before our eyes, you know, it's it's all all things that happens been, um, behind that we just put a price on and we need to know something about everything that happens behind before we put a price on it. So we actually do it the right way and think about everything so we don't get this market failure. That we market don't failure the, and uh, mm. sustainability failure as well. Yeah, but sustainability uh, failure is a market failure or the other way. If we don't have sustainability, we have done something wrong. It's, it's I think, uh, exactly as you say. Uh, and I think in some ways, maybe the next generation is more articulated around this than, than mine, at least. Uh, uh, you know, uh, not dealing with this in a sustainable way is simply uh, like chopping off the branch that you're sitting on, right? Uh, we, we, mm. we won't be able to, to fish farm in the future unless we do it in a way that is uh, uh, aiming for the future. Yeah. That's right, but it's very promising what is going on on the time. It's a, it's a very promising development in uh, uh, with a better uh, focus on on registration fish welfare. I think that camera technology is very promising coming up. We don't have to take the fish out of the out of the water to look at it, and also uh, the focus on feed. How do we produce feed for the fish? So I think the development is uh, is very promising and. It's a healthy product we are producing. Mm. And it's one of the main projects for Norway for the future as well. I just want you to, towards our, the end of our conversation, to talk a little bit about possible uh, spillover effects to other industries. So, so you know, is there is there um, points here in our conversation related to fish welfare and industrial farming that could uh, be relevant for people who work in agriculture, uh, or um, forestry, or uh, other resources from the sea, or you know, or, or or is there knowledge transfer maybe from those industries into yours? So are there people in oil and gas and you know platforms that can help us with producing even better fish pens? Uh, this is this this happens already <laughs> because you had a drop in the oil industry and much of the technology from the oil industry. And many people from the oil industry went into the fish farming in on the sea. Um, by yeah, that's many types of equipment. It's the boats. Um, so so we it's already. Uh, I think we have exchange of uh, of knowledge already, but it could mm. be better improved. <laughs> yeah, and I think the aquaculture also is very. It's a dynamic, dynamic. Uh, industry uh, I, I also have the um, I think they are good at talking we are all good at talking to each other and trying to to work together and collaborate and I think I think the industry is good at that uh, yeah I have uh, just towards the the very end uh, two short questions um, so one is about uh, recommended uh, reading and viewing, and um, uh, one of you recommended uh, Moby Dick, and I just find it a fascinating uh, old story, uh, especially given uh, Norway's uh, um, whaling history and now fishing industry history. Um, and then there is a there is a uh, there is a. A, a more kind of nerdic book book about from Jonathan uh, Rushton. I don't know, Cecilia. Do you want to comment on these two? Well, Moby Dick. I think uh, if if one have the opportunity to read it in Norwegian, one should because it's a very good translation. Uh, and the English one is very heavy, heavy language. It's a lot of words in uh, long sentences. But I think what's the point of Moby Dick is you think it's about the sea and the whale, but it's about so much more. And I think this is perhaps uh, what ref is reflected here also. It, we have to dive deeper into our own perspectives and our own, um, uh, what should I say, uh, how we look at the world. Because Moby Dick is... Uh, uh, to me, it was an eye-opener into how do they look at the world 
at that time and and it's it's um yeah you should read whoever hasn't it's read the book with should the nature read it. or win over nature perhaps yeah especially uh, from uh, Akab. yeah and uh, jonathan Jonathan Roshan is more a uh, heavy, uh, heavy. Uh, <laughs> that's more about how we use economics to say something about animal health and welfare and what mm. we should think about. So, mm. yeah. How do you measure the the value of life, but apply yes. to animals? And and who measures it when the ones that we do measure can speak for themselves? Mm. And then, and then, my final question, I guess, is: uh, um, uh, there is a quote that uh, you also mentioned, Cecilia. In the long run, we are all dead, uh, and that's by John Maynard Keynes. Um, but, but still, we need to do the best we can while we are here. And I just like you to 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 kind of give me what really motivates you. Uh, in doing what you're doing, both related to fish welfare, but perhaps uh, mm -hmm. environment and uh, growth related. Yeah, the, the reason why I got into to this PhD and also working with this is uh, perhaps what I've learned through the studies, but also what I learned working in the field uh, with Solvay and looking at the fish. It's it, These are living beings we are working with and we have to ensure that we 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 are working sustainable and i think working sustainable is ensuring good health and good welfare and and that's the the key issue that's what motivates me and even though we are dead in the long run all of us we should think about if this is what motivates, motivates us it shouldn't there's a generation after us and there's a planet to take care of. So even if we are dead in the long run, we should someone something else should motivate us than that. <laughs> and Solvay. No, it's it's fascinating to be in a very in a in a development all the time for making a good and healthy food with a, a low carbon emission and uh and working against towards uh, sustainable uh, food production, and when you feel it's useful, what you are doing, that's that's uh, that's stimulating. Yeah. You, you you work with global strategies for Greek uh, seafood. Is there is are there points here where we can help uh, at the global level, not just at the national level? Uh, I think so. Uh, much of the knowledge from Norway has been used in uh, in Canada and in, in overseas and also other places in Europe. But of course, they get their experience and we get our, and we had to exchange the knowledge to be better. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I will leave this as an open invitation to anyone both working within um, aquaculture but also in related industries to think about how they can either contribute with thinking about welfare of these uh, animal as resources and uh, also about data. Thank you for an interesting and learned rich conversation. Thank you.